Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome to Listen Money Matters. Cats have no money. They're broke their entire lives. You know why cats have no money? No pockets. <laughs> my name is Thomas. I don't get that catchphrase. <laughs> I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Andrew. Uh, do you get that catchphrase? I, is that I, from a movie? or is that like... It was from a conversation we had about making cat pants, I think. Maybe it was cat oh, pants or sweaters. On the podcast? Maybe. Or maybe it's I mean, not. I don't know. I've, I've definitely talked about sweaters for cats. I think like every episode we ever do on entrepreneurship, I'm just like, you know, the quintessential business to start is to knit sweaters for cats. I figured the catchphrase has cats and we're posting this on the internet, so it's bound to go viral. I thought that was it's just... true. Instant recipe for virality. But dude, so I'm drinking a beer. It's called... Un mas todo Jesus, which roughly translates to even more all Jesus. And when if, I, if Martin heard you pronounce that, I think his <laughs> head would explode. I, I look, I'm from well, Madrid. Un, trust un mas me. todos Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a angry Brooklyn bit to it. Angry but Brooklyn dude who doesn't speak a lick of Spanish. I poured this beer. It was so dark. It was like I was pouring like oil into my glass. It, mm. it is so good. It's 12% ABV, so about 10 minutes into this conversation, I'm probably just going to disappear. <laughs> okay. But so Dustin uh, and I will just like, we'll hit it hard. All this right. great content. It'll be like, where'd Andrew go? This is my he's contribution. Yeah, he's on the floor, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was, oh, I was with my grandpa. I saw my grandpa for the first time in 10 years uh, last week when I was at VidCon. Because mm-hmm. he lives out in California. And he was like... I thought you were going to say because he had a YouTube you know, channel. Yeah, my grandpa's got... He's a YouTuber. Um, so he, we were just grabbing a beer together. And he's like... So the other week I was with some friends. And they had this imported beer from Belgium that was 19% ABV. Wow. I'm like, holy crap. I, I, I thought he was going to be like 12. And I was going to be like, oh, grandpa, you know nothing about the craft beer scene. But no, <laughs> 19. I don't think I've seen anything that high. Uh, and the ABV of what I'm drinking is zero because I've got just my cold pressed green kale juice again. Mm. That I, time I think day. everyone is resonating with that kale juice right now, Thomas. I can see the chunks of kale. <laughs> you're from. you're really improving the ratings of these podcasts. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, we're that money podcast where we drink, except for one of the hosts isn't cool, doesn't drink beer, <laughs> and just chugs disgusting kale juice the whole time. Anyway, Justin, welcome back to the show, dude. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. You know, we spoke about cat sweaters last time I was on. <laughs> really? Right. It was the yes. episode with you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Andrew, either the universe works and twerks in mysterious ways or something subconscious in your head was just like another episode with Justin. We're going right back to the cat sweaters. <laughs> I, I see your headshot. I'm like, oh, cats. Yeah. <laughs> and I even remember seeing a couple of pictures of you, Andrew, on social media at the ugly sweater party. Ah, uh, yes. Right? Yeah. And I was like, I wonder, can we get that on a cat? <laughs> oh my god, yeah. that would be awesome. That yeah. would human be progress like... has come this far and it is for that reason. It is all I'm, to be able to put his I'm gonna have to sell posters of that. That'll be my next major <laughs> revenue stream. Bell and merch. I we quit my job, up. so I really have nothing better to do. I'll, they'll probably be hand stitched by me, honestly. Nice. <laughs> well, in that case, that either increases or decreases the price. <laughs> what are we yeah. talking about, Thomas? We are talking about investing, which um, I'm I'm pretty excited for this topic because I have been wanting to do like an investing basics blog post on College Info Geek for a while. Um, and I brain dumped like 2,000 words and then realized like I hadn't even scratched the surface. So this is a topic that can get real complex real fast. So I'm kind of hoping that like Justin with all his years of wisdom that I don't have can kind of help us rein it in and only focus on what's important for people who are beginners. Because I want to be like, yo, how do we short stocks and stuff? But that's <laughs> that's step uh, one, right, Justin? <laughs> yeah. I step mean, one, I... short United. Boom. <laughs> but no, so, okay, how do we get started investing? Um, and actually, you know what? So the question I get from students all the time whenever we talk about investing is like, I've got student debt, so when do I start investing? Do I pay all that off first? Do I start now and kind of split it up? Do I only do the minimums of my debt and put everything else into investments? What's the timing strategy here? Yeah, I would do both. I mean, I think... 
let's just say that you've got student loan interest at like five, six, seven, eight percent. Uh, now, obviously, you do the math. You have to do better than that in a portfolio to feel like you're actually getting ahead. But paying off student debt can take a long time, and sometimes you pay it off in like a chunk. Like, let's say you yeah. get a bonus or something like that. I like the whole thing of doing both because it makes you feel like you're actually have money and that you could invest in something that's working for you. And it's not just like you're working to pay bills and pay off your student loans. And then in three years, you have no assets. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly it's complete mental accounting because if you just took $5,000 and invested it versus $5,000 and paid off the debt, it's six and a half of one dozen the other. But we got to get people to feel like they're making progress in their financial lives and seeing that. And mm -hmm. I think it's, equally important to have something that you can look at and see the value of rather than just paying something down. So it kind of sounds like you're a little bit on the emotional side when it comes to making financial decisions. And by I, I kind of mean like we talk about like stack versus snowball a lot of times and how yeah. like snowball yeah. is an emotional win, stack is a mathematical win. Yeah. I like so, snowball. I think like you could pay down the lower ones, get a big win, cut up the card, have a cat sweater slash cut up credit card party <laughs> or wear your cat sweater to that. You know what I mean? Just like, okay, got to get some wins. And if you can get them early, like when you're in your twenties, that's huge. Mm. You Versus know what? Trying to get wins in your forties. Yeah. I think you're, I don't know if the word is right, but I think you have a valid point because I mean, Andrew, we usually talk about how like we favor the stack method here. I think in several episodes you have said like, if you want to feel good, go drink wine and watch The View or something and then suck it up and use the stack method, you nerd, or something like that. But I do remember when I was in college, one of my big goals was to pay off all my student loans, which were like at 3% interest before I graduated. And mm -hmm. mathematically, that's leaving money on the table because I could have put, I mean, my my stock, um, my, my index fund has made, I don't know, what, 11% over the life or something like that currently because we're in a pretty good market period right now. So it's like, okay, I left that 7% gap on the table by investing money to accelerate my debt payoff. But you know what? I felt so good when I paid off those loans and knowing that I was going to graduate without this like ball and chain of debt around my leg, I think just like it insanely motivated me and it let me – it like gave me permission pretty much to pursue things I probably wouldn't have otherwise pursued. So. Yeah, I mean that's that stack thing is like you have to understand that there's a there's a emotion and day to day part of actually paying off those cards. That some people may may start doing it for a year or two, but then they miss a payment, they use that money for something else, and then they feel like they never get ahead and they're like, Oh, screw it, I'll just always be in debt. But even if you pay off that one card with like 800 bucks on it, it's still a win mm. and it might give you the fuel to do the next thing. You've been conspicuously silent on this, Andrew. Are you sitting there like you know, feeling like we're betraying your, your no, mathematical – The thing is – here. So uh, when it comes to the debt, um, the debts, I think that automating it uh, and, and like paying the highest interest rate first, I, I think that personally – I feel like you should follow the math, but when it comes to investing and debt, I agree with Justin because I actually have this friend who earns quite a lot of money. He's a lead at Instagram, does things. His wife's a lawyer. They both make a lot of money, but they have enormous amounts of student loan debt. And we're mm -hmm. joking how like very soon we're going to have their zero party where they're like officially yeah. worth nothing. Oh, you know, and it's one thing if like when you're like 35 and you're officially worth nothing, and then you start, but if you're like net worth nothing and you have assets that are compounding, at least you feel like you have some momentum. You're in the game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can see that. And the other so, thing is, like Facebook owns Instagram, right? So there's a 401k there. So if you put money into a 401k, you're gonna get a match and a profit sharing that you yeah. would have otherwise not got had you not done it. Those RSUs that he gets. Yeah, yeah, so I guess the first thing I'll say up front is like, most people who are going to start investing listening to this podcast probably have a full-time job. Mm. I mean, we, I'm sure we have students listening. I'm sure we have people who are contractors, all kinds of stuff, but the majority probably have a full-time job. So first and foremost, if you've done no investing, if your company has a 401k with matching, like go to the max of the match because that is 
a hundred percent return on your money. You can't beat that. Um, now I'm curious to know what your guys' thoughts are on what I was going to write in my article, because what I said with regards to starting your investing before you pay off your debt, I think there's like a spread that you have to hit before it makes sense. And the number that I used in my article was 2%. So if you can make on average 2% higher than what the percent or the interest rate of your debt is, then it makes sense. But if you can't, I guess the problem is like if you hit hard times, that debt still has to be paid, notwithstanding any forgiveness options you have. But it's not like you're going to, you know, lose a ton by not investing for a while in the market. So like there's kind of like a risk reward thing there. Yeah, I, I just think it, it really depends on each person. I like that 2% though. That gets me thinking like, okay, yeah, I mean, that makes sense because you've got, you know, maybe fees or taxes or inflation or something like that. That speaks to me. Um, you know, and a lot of these these rates are going to go higher as the Fed raises rates, they'll kind of go up. So that'll make it even more of like, gee, maybe I should pay down more of it. Mm. I think it's a case by case. Uh, and I think, I think both, you know, just it kind of diversifies you a little bit and makes you feel like you've got both. It's hard. There's no right way. You got to do what feels good to you. So okay. I have two questions for you, Justin. Uh, one, I have this friend. Uh, she uses this thing called Snapchat. I haven't used it myself, but here it's like kind of like a big deal. And you can like invest your money in it. So um, I, was, I was thinking of putting all my money into Snapchat. <laughs> Is that a good way to begin investing? <laughs> Oh my god! I'm gonna turn this podcast uh, off right no, now. No, we gotta be diver- we gotta be diversified. Um, what does that even you know, mean? So you gotta okay. The, you guys definitely have have seen the movie Office Space, right? I yes. mean that it, that is you, right? That is required. So, I, th- I I think that's required viewing for any college student. Yeah, just like to know what the working world is gonna be like because <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like bleak and satirical, but like surprisingly accurate in many ways. So you know that commute that he had going into the office where he was going like two miles an hour yeah. and then the, the lane stopped where he couldn't even change lanes because <laughs> it, it, like he was just like in between lanes. So a lot of people invest the same way where they're in one lane and that lane is slowing down and then they see this next lane and they want to move into that and then they mm. change lanes. The lane they change into slows down. The lane that they leave takes off. So we get really, really emotional. Ooh, taking a quick sip of beer, I like that, all right? We get Always. really, really emotional about investing. And financial advisors do that too, where they'll try to sell you a lane that's done well in the past. And there's some like weird thinking like, oh, so if gold went up by 10%, that means it's gonna go up again? Mm-hmm. Like there's no correlation, none. Like if yeah. you flip a coin five times in its tails, does the six time mean it's definitely got to be tails? <laughs> I got a hot hand. Yeah. So <laughs> what I believe everyone should do, and this is general investing advice, is mm-hmm. to invest in each lane rather than try to pick a lane that's going to go up. So you're saying Snapchat so, and Facebook. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's like two cat sweaters. No, I need a sweater. <laughs> I need some tidy whities I need a pair of jeans. I need some socks and a pair of shoes. That's diversification. Now we know Justin wears tidy whities There you go. So <laughs> we'll group this with our financially naked episode. That's I right. love that. <laughs> Sorry, so, go on. So, so many people think, you know, and then I've got some clients that'll call me. They're like, I want to buy Apple. They're coming out with the iPhone 8. Hmm. I'm like, do you think you're the only one that knows about the Apple iPhone 8? Right? Hmm. So <laughs> uh, I happen to think that most of the time, all of the info that's out there is factored into the stock's price. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big, big opinion that a lot of people don't agree with. And there's really? two so camps. There are people who don't believe that news is already factored into the price? Correct. Because it's all what they think is it's all about information to a certain extent and whether that information is oh. um factored into that stock's price See, i think that when you find out like you are probably the second to last person in the world to find out about anything because there's some guy who's like third in command of goldman who like plays golf with donald trump's something and he knows like months before you do about whatever yes and stocks will go up in advance people know 
like I know yeah. the iPhone tens coming out in three years, you know, unless something crazy happens like that, that's something that just happens. So making an investment decision on something that banal is just, okay. So, so not you're not, work. you're not, uh, so, and I agree with you that when news comes out, like it's not worth investing in because it's already factored in. So if I, Apple's coming out with a new iPhone, the price has already gone up. So what do you do? I mean, you, I think most yeah. people think to invest in like Apple or Nike or I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't, I, I, you know, you look at like a Peter Lynch who managed like the Fidelity Magellan Fund, which was like 50 billion in the 80s and 90s, which that's a huge number back then. Mm. And he's like, I only buy stuff that I, that I use and shop and like at and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And Warren Buffett says the same thing. Like the guy doesn't understand tech to the extent that, you know, it's why he's never bought Amazon or something like that. Mm. I believe, I don't believe that. I don't believe that you should just buy what you know and understand. I believe that you should buy everything, both what you know everything. and what you don't know. Yeah, I believe in index funds. I don't believe oh, I, okay. that the so, average. Yeah. So you're going to have yeah, index funds. Yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah. Like, so the person that's listening to this, if you're in your 20s, like, or you got a job or whatever, you need to be in index funds for a whole host of reasons. Um, diversification low fees and simple. I think we started talking about at the beginning of the show where like everyone thinks that it's so much stuff that we need to know about investing in money, but really it's very, very simple. Mm -hmm. The talking heads on all the news channels and all that, they make it look like there's so much going on and there's 52 moving parts. No, but they got to do that. But like, it is so simple. Can you yeah. explain Invest. what an index fund is? Because I feel like people hear this thrown around all over the place and it, it I might as well be the next Snapchat. Yes. All right. So what let's let's talk beer. Mm. So we have like all these different beers that we can buy. I'm just going to go with like Budweiser, Coors, you know, uh, uh, Sam Adams. The list of Bath, beers you should never buy. OK. Pacifico, <laughs> El Sol, yeah. you know, all the micro breweries. So let's just say there's 500 beers. Mm. Right. And you could say, well, I don't like 10 of those. They're bad. And then I want to buy, you know, I want to double up on the kale beer that Thomas is drinking. And then I want to, I don't want to buy the hops beer or whatever. So all of a sudden you have 300 beers and out of those 300, you've doubled up on 40 of them. Mm. So it's really, you know, you have 200 or whatever. So, but what if the beers that you picked don't go up by the extent that you think and what if the beers that you didn't pick went up by more than the ones that you picked? Well, you look My, like a sucker and you lose out. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're playing beer pong and you have like you're upside down on a keg, right? <laughs> so what you got to do is you just pick them all. If you just buy all 500, you have exposure on any one that's going to go up. And you don't have to pay someone a fee, an ongoing fee to pick the right beers. So here, here's the yeah. thing that, that I think is confusing. So I buy every stock like in the U S or whatever, you know, where this index fund does it. Why do I make money? Like, cause some are going up, but some are going down. Wouldn't it just be like zero or I don't know. Well, it's the average. <laughs> no. Well, I, mean, I, you're I guess kind of following the economy, which tell me like I'm fine. It goes up. What why was your does question, it, Andrew? I said, tell me like I'm five. Like, why does it okay. go up? Because the collective universe of companies make more money every year. And they also, a lot of them pay out dividends. So mm -hmm. if a dividend is, let's say you get one or 2% on your money, and then the growth in the earnings of each company just goes up by three or 4%. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you should be making five or six percent. So, as companies, I mean, look at the growth of your podcast. That's an ex ex easy example. Mm. You started off with one listener, right? The cat behind his mom, exactly. <laughs> and then you grew from there. So, mm. even though you are you're you're growing, you might not be able to sustain that. Like you know, like Google grew really really high, but it's not going to grow at the same rate. Yeah, it still will be able to grow by something because long term the economy goes up and earnings go up and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're saying that if you buy the US economy, like buy every stock that you'll move forward maybe 5% in a year because some will go up, some will go down, but compared to the savings account that pays you point nothing percent interest, like you're already many fold beating the the average saver. You are. However, 
you can't be like the guy in office space because people freak out and they change lanes when they lose money and they don't stay Mm -hmm. the course. And on top of that, when we're talking about the 500 beer example, Mm -hmm. the beer and stocks, right? Well, it's kind of the same thing. That's just one lane on a five lane freeway. So between 2000 and 2010, the stock market averaged like 2%. Nothing. And had you been in a CD, wow. lane yeah. number two, or a bond, mm. you would have made 5%. Ah. So all of those people were like, you know, oh my God, why am I in stocks to begin with? Well, the whole mm. point of investing, just keeping it very simple, is I need a car in every lane on the freeway. So if I put all my money in an index funds, you, in, in like one, five index funds, you're saying I am not appropriately diversified. Correct. Yeah. So, but there are different index funds. There's a stock. So here are the, here are a few of the lanes so we can give people a chance to understand Mm. stock index funds, bond index funds, real estate index funds, and commodity index funds. Those are just four keeping it very simple. Okay. Oil. Bananas. Yeah. Oil, gas, gold, Mm. not Exxon. Right. Because so Exxon like is all a stock. the companies that do oil. No, no, no. I'm talking no? about the actual price of the commodity. Oh, so like crude oil. Exactly. Prices. So if you yeah, diversify like, across these five, you will own gold. So when you see those commercials on Fox at like 1 p.m., you're like, yeah, I own it. And then when people are talking <laughs> about the new Apple Watch, you're like, yeah, I own it. Correct. Essentially, the goal is to own a little bit of everything. And you're saying that when averaged across, it will always move forward. Uh, when averaged across, it will move forward long term. There might be a year or two where it doesn't work. But the whole point of what we're trying to do with our money is get ahead. Like we got to get ahead. We got to like get ahead in life. So the best way to get ahead is to actually save, then have your money compound. And I'm sure you guys have hit the whole compounding thing, right? Mm-hmm. So what's the what's the most intelligent way to have things compound through Warren Buffett's rule number one, make money. Rule number two, don't lose money. Rule number three, don't lose money, right? Yeah. So it's not to lose money. So what's the best strategy, in my opinion, to try not to lose money? The freeway lane, the five lanes. Because if you're in one mm-hmm. lane, you're back to the office space. You're making one or two percent. Could you imagine all the people from 2000 to 2010 who are like, you know what? Forget it. I'm not into stocks. I don't like mutual funds. It didn't work. Do you know how much money they left on the table between yeah. 2010 and now? Like a gigantic. Yeah. It's been amount. insane. Yeah. But yeah. okay, so let me ask you this: um, you you've invested across the five lanes, right? Um, some are moving forward. Some are moving back. Uh, I, I forgot my question. <laughs> I bet I know what it is. What tells it like like do you actually make money or do you just like tread water for like thirty years? Yeah. No, no. I mean you you make money and you um you compound and then when things go bad, you're not getting killed. That's the thing. You're not losing as much on the downside. You're not making as much on the upside, but it's consistency yep. that's huge. Ah. So uh, you were talking about switching lanes, and I guess, I'll, and you were saying that people make poor decisions, like they may sell because you know when it hits a hundred, I'm going to sell. You know, and they're cutting their gains, or then it crashes and they sell. So you you're essentially saying buy across all of the lanes, and then just buy more across all the lanes. Don't take an action, like don't well, it- pull back. Correct. So he, here's an example. I'm sure you guys, oh, you're like a real estate guru, right? So let me ask you this, Andrew. <laughs> if right? you ask I mean, my mom, I am. Yeah. So <laughs> Thomas, have you thought about investing in real estate? I have no desire to do it now. You know, but in the future, do you see yourself wanting to no. do it? Okay. Nope. It's too much well, of a hassle. Lo- I can put my time into businesses and, and make much more money. So, I'm with you on that. But, but that that's have, my personal, yeah. like Andrew is okay with finding a property manager and all that crap. And I'm just like, yeah. I'll go sell more ads or I'll hire yeah. people, but that's it. me. And you know, real estate is a totally great option for people who have the interest. I explored it and I was just like, I think I could focus somewhere else. Yeah. So let's but talk about, let's just assume that I do want to do it for well, the sake of your yeah, example. Yeah. So 
the third lane, no stocks, bonds, real estate, right? So mm -hmm. real estate's the third lane. So um, for like the last 10 years, everyone has been saying real estate's overvalued. You should not be in REITs. It's REIT, Real Estate Investment mm -hmm. Trust. You shouldn't be in them. They're overvalued, blah, blah, blah. So REITs are basically US company stocks that own like commercial, industrial, hotels, malls, storage, all that, right? So yeah. everyone's like, oh, it's over overvalued. You should get out of it. Like if you bailed on that lane, you left gobs of money on the table, like huge money. So my thing is, I don't really have an edge. I don't know when real estate's high or low. I can think about it and give an opinion like all the mm. CNBC and Fox people, right? But you never yeah. really know. So you don't leave a lane, you just keep the exposure. You might reduce a little bit, but you never leave a lane because you're not smarter than anyone else to determine whether you should not have exposure there. Mm. Exactly. I think one thing to note here is like pe people do quote the whole Warren Buffett thing, just like invest in what you know and all that kind of stuff. Couple things. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have made it clear that they basically sit around reading all day, every single day. So like if you're not doing that, then you probably don't know enough. And the other thing is, I think there's been research to show that maybe 75 percent of all money managers yep. who like it is their profession to pick stocks do not beat the index. Correct. So it's like you either find a guy who's in the minority or you are as smart as Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and you have the time to sit around reading things and deeply understanding them or you follow the index. You know, so what, what's worth the effort to you? And I mean, there's a lot of people who are going to be here like, man, I want to make more than that. I want to beat the index. I, I don't want to do the boring thing. And that's fine because there's plenty of people in the investing community who get into this stuff and they get off on it. But Justin, you're shaking what's your, your value? Head. Like what, what is your value? What would you rather do with the time you have after work? Do you, you want to go I agree like, with you. look at the earnings yeah. report of Rexan Pharmaceutical, tiny little biotech company or something? Or do you want to go hang out with your friends? and know that your Betterment account or your, or your Vanguard account is making you 10% with no effort. Yeah, no, I completely part. agree. I mean, I think that, so with active money management, that's what it's called. So everyone listening, passive is you own 500 beers. Active is you own 240 and 40 of those 240 are doubled up. So and you're paying you're gonna, a guy to, to yeah, pick so up So if you're gonna usually. pay someone, you're paying them four to five times the fee to do that and then 80% of the time, they're not keeping up with the benchmark. So I gotta just, the elephant in the room mm. is that we love winning. We love beating the average. We love drinking a better beer than the average Michelob. Right. But with investing and with our money, let's, in my opinion, buy the index, It's diversify. just very unlikely that you will beat the average, is what you're saying. Yeah. Because yeah. if everyone's trying to beat the average and they all have more information than you, and they're smarter or they dedicate more time than you, like you, you don't have a chance. Yeah. You know. So Justin, you, uh, we, we had talked about this episode before we were going to record it. And like, I don't know, five minutes before we did the episode, you sent me an email with like five or six nebulous words in it. One of these words that was in yes. the email you sent me was rebalancing. And I think that you were kind of talking about it, but could you maybe explain what rebalancing is uh should you care or like should the average person even be doing this or taking action and i'll be honest i don't even know if the regular a normal person should be <laughs> rebalancing yeah well let's just go with a two-lane hypothetical and let's just say that you want to have five hundred dollars in stocks and mm -hmm. five hundred dollars in bonds so you always want to be 50-50, right? Yeah. And let's say that the stock lane goes down by $100 and now you're at 400 in stocks and 500 in bonds. Mm -hmm. So what this is all about is buying low and selling high. So in this ah. example, you now have $900, you lost 100 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So you now need to take 50 from the bonds and buy 50 in stocks. Ah. So it's buy low, sell high. But what does the average investor do? They I'm do learning something right now. I, I didn't they, think of it like this. They buy high and sell low. Yeah, because mm -hmm. everyone's like, I'm going to hold this stock until it hits 100 that I'm going to sell. But I always wonder, like, what if the stock goes to 200 and you sold yeah, before? So, you, so It's like greed and loss aversion what, drive yeah. people to do the opposite of what they should do. 
Because I'm like you, Andrew. I'm like, whoa, what if United goes up to 90 bucks? I should just hold on to it. <laughs> you know, but then if it like starts tanking again, I'm just like, oh, no, abandon ship. Well, Hopefully keep the gains I got. Let me ask you this, Justin. So I think so in this scenario, it was like declining. So you took 50 from the one that was doing well and put it into the declining one. What happens? I, I guess I guess the reverse is the same thing is when it's doing really well. You're saying you're essentially saying pull out and put into the correct. Wh- why, though? That, that sounds counterintuitive. Like if it's because, doing well, well, don't I want to keep doing more? So if it's tails five times, is mm. it going to be tails the sixth time? No, it's a 50% chance every time. There you go. And if you go the opposite and let's just say, you know, 500, 500, and then it goes to 600 in stocks and 500 in bonds, you're at 1,100 and you want to take 50 off the table. All you're doing is selling $50 of the 600. Okay. So you're not leaving the lane. I think, I think like uh, people's, or, or, I mean, people, at least my perception of like, well, I'm investing in stocks and I want to make the most amount of money possible and get the highest return. But what you're saying is calm down and it, and make the most amount of money over 30 years. Forget about next month. Forget about this year. So just because one lane is moving faster, you have to be adjusted for a year, two years, whatever down the line when the lanes switch. Correct. And it's, it's mm. about wanting to win the war and maybe you lose mm. the battle. Yeah. Okay. So I have what may be a dumb question and I, I, I could probably work my way through this on my own, but because I have the question, I think other people are going to have it. So with regards to rebalancing, when I was in college, I got a Vanguard fund that was not right for me. It was like too too conservative of a mix, too much bonds. So eventually, I moved all of it over to the total stock index. But I paid capital gains to move it. So like when you're rebalancing, aren't you paying that capital gains tax mm. to do that? And does that loss in taxes, like? is that made up for by the rebalancing or does it not matter because you're kind of like balancing out because of the losses on the other thing that you're rebalancing to? Yeah. uh, Number one, everyone needs to consult their own tax person when they look at their own tax stuff. I got to just say that because I'm a CFP and blah, blah, blah. (laughs) So number two, um, if it's in a retirement account, it doesn't matter because there's no taxes. Number three, now we're talking about, all right, well, does it make sense to pay capital gains to move in? And most of the time, in my opinion, it depends, but I would say yes. Like, mm. could you imagine the people that didn't want to sell out of the stock market in 2007 because they were afraid to pay capital gains, and then in that's 2008 true. it ah. got cut in half? That's I don't a, believe in a... making decisions based on taxes. If okay. you're making money, pay taxes, and that's a good thing. And if you no actually, what. Yeah. yeah, and if you rebalance and you you have a gain, you could get. This is a different topic, but. You, you could do something which is called tax loss harvesting, which means you can sell one and buy another. Justin, can you explain tax loss harvesting again? Because there's a little bit of roboting. And I feel like yeah, everyone yeah, was yeah, like, you yeah. had them right there. Yes. And then- <laughs> I know. All right. All right. So let's pretend that, um, that you uh, – I'll go with a real world example. Commodities, right? Mm-hmm. Commodities is like oil, gas – you know, gold, metals, and all that stuff. So right now we have like no inflation, like there's none. So commodities are not doing well Mm. because there's no inflation. So let's just say that you own ABC commodity fund that you bought for 10 grand. Mm. And all of a sudden it's at 7,000 now. Now remember I said, you never want to leave a lane because you don't know if commodities are going to turn around and go up. Right. So you have the ABC fund that you bought at 10 and it's now worth seven. You can sell the ABC fund, take a loss of three grand, then you can take that $7,000 and buy a different commodity fund. It cannot be the same fund. If it's the same fund, you have to wait 31 days. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to wait 31 days. We'll just buy a different fund. So we take that seven grand, we buy XYZ commodity fund. We take that 3,000, that's now a loss, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
So we buy seven thousand dollars and we buy X Y Z commodity fund. What you're saying and is essentially the same thing as ABC. The same strategy, yeah. yeah. And if the seven grand goes up to ten, you'll make it on the X Y Z, even though the ABC one went from ten to seven and then so back to ten. What happens with you're, this three thousand? So, so okay. if I understand correctly, we were at ten. We lost yep. three. We yep. went from. Joe or ABC doing the strategy and then XYZ doing the exact same strategy, just they're called different names. Mm -hmm. So we, we moved our money over and we have this like three grand loss that sits there. What happens with that? That three, three say that 10 times fast, that three <laughs> grand loss can offset against a gain that Thomas was talking about, like when he made a switch. Uh -huh. Or okay. you can take the 3000 that you lose and offset it against your earned income, like in a job. So okay, if you yeah. are constantly rebalancing and tax loss harvesting, uh, potentially that, that tax scenario that Thomas talked about would, would not be a, a cost because you would have had losses that you were harvesting over time. Correct. It's like opening a really bad bottle of wine. I'm like, oh, this thing stinks. I'm going to, you know, sell it and then just go drink another bottle. And then when wine goes up, boom, you're done. <laughs> Who's going to buy a really bad bottle of wine from me? <laughs> oh, I know. That Probably Thomas already took a sip out of. <laughs> yeah. No, okay. that's why they're going to buy it. This is an authentic bottle of wine that Thomas Frank drank out of. Okay. So. 50 cents. <laughs> to, to rewind a little bit, you were taught, we were, we like, grazed over retirement accounts and we have you know 10,000 spread across a bunch of swimming lanes uh it, in I guess a normal account right like a brokerage account just taxable mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then we have 10,000 in a 401k Roth IRA blah 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 all these acronyms of all the things like why does it matter like why is one better is one better um yeah well that was a retirement really bad question good luck <laughs> no no I, I think i think what what people are thinking about when they get into the workforce and they get out of school is like should they invest for retirement in like a 401k or should they put the money in like a savings account or some sort of investment accounts for like a house mm -hmm. so most of the time when you're investing for retirement i want people to think that it's retirement it's not money for a house even though there are some Separate rules and some tax, yeah some tax breaks for a first-time home buyer and all that i would not i would look retirement money is when you're over age 60 and house money is in a separate account that you can access mm. and if it's within five years just keep it in the bank i wouldn't take that much risk let it grow you know a little bit of fungus and some mold on it and let it just sit and that's okay because it's there when you need it for the house fund. I think that's what we've Correct. usually d talked about. Like when people ask us like, oh, I, I want to buy a house in the next two or three years. Should I put my money in Betterment or some investment account? And we're like, well, the gains you're likely to make in two years are probably not going to be super high. And I wouldn't say that that, that reward offsets the risk of losing, you know, ending up mm. with less. So, yeah, for me, investing is like a long term game. The, For sure. The thing is, like, uh, I, I would like to think that I'm young. Thomas is extremely young. Uh, a lot of people listening are, are somewhere in between. Uh, and to think of, like, retirement, which is, like, 60, 70, is, like, kind of ridiculous or slash, like, can't even imagine. I can't even imagine what I will be like in five years, let alone in blah, blah, blah years, because I can't do math. Like, why... Um, it, I don't know. I, I guess sell me on it. You know what? Mm. This is what I see. Cause like I am in the trenches doing this stuff with my clients and the, you know, it's really weird. The number one reason why they want to invest for retirement is because, because they see that their parents are struggling. Ah. Mm. They see that their yep. parents are not well off or there was a time when they were in their teens when money was tight for their parents or they're seeing their parents still working or they can't buy the vacation home or whatever. And they're like, you know what? I don't want to be like my parents. I want to have choice and flexibility on what I want to do when I'm in my 60s. And that's why they're saving. Yeah. I agree with that 100%.
it's, I mean, it's one of the big reasons I'm saving. So, so why? Okay. So, um, generally my understanding is retirement accounts just like kind of lock it up for you. So if you want to take it, you're penalized to some extent beyond that, like firewall between your day to day money, your house money and your retirement money. Like why are retirement accounts good? Like why should I care about a 401k or a Roth IRA? Yeah, well, it, it forces you not to get the money because of the penalties. So that's mm. number one. Um, the 401k, you'll usually get a company match if you're an employee. And, you know, we really haven't talked a lot about Roth IRAs. And I think we, I think like, you know, I wish Roth IRAs were around. By the way, I am not like 60 years old. I'm 44. But Roth IRAs were not around like when I was in college, you know, or getting oh, out of really? college. They weren't. No. So there were only IRAs. The, I don't know when the Roth was or, or if it was, I didn't know about it, but mm -hmm. now it's widely known. So Roth IRAs are great. Um, just to review for everyone, you put money in, there are no, um, you don't get any tax breaks or deductions. You're using after tax money. So yeah. it's like you get your paycheck, there's tax withholding, the money hits your local B of A or Chase account or whatever. Then you're taking that money and putting it in a Roth and you cannot get to it um, until you're age 60 with the exception of the amount of money that you put in. Let me just repeat that. So everyone understands you can put in, let's just say hypothetically five grand, that 5,000 that you put in, you can get to whenever you want because you've already paid taxes on it. Yeah. So let's just say that that 5,000 grows to 30,000 by the time you're 60 right. on that 30 G's. When you take it out, there are no taxes. Mm -hmm. All of it. Correct. So, I have clients that have normal IRAs where they're pre-tax and they deducted it, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, hey, Justin, send me a check for 20 grand. I need a new roof. And I'll ask them, well, how much do you want in state and federal withholding? And they're like, oh my God, I forgot about that. So their 20 grand that they take out of their IRA or 401k, or whatever you want to call it, is only 12. Mm. So now they need to sell 30 in their IRA to net the 20. But in a Roth, if you needed 20, you just take out 20. Yeah. If you put in 20. No, you could put in five when you were 20 years old. You could put in five grand. It oh, could you're saying 20, but you could take 20 out in retirement and it, yes. because it's all. So. So that's huge. And there are a lot of people who will come out and I, I'm going to go back to the emotions of this because mm. they'll poo poo the fact that. Don't do a Roth because you don't get a tax deduction and blah, blah, blah. This and is what I was going to bring up. Like, Yeah, and based on my hypothetical fuzzy, major fuzzy math, I've just run some scenarios where it's about 17 years. For me, for my own thing, I was like, you know what? It's about a 17-year break even because the money that, you, that you're that you paying in taxes, right? If you put five grand into a, a, a pre-tax IRA, mm. you're saving, let's just say you're saving two. So in the scenario would be like, well, what would you, what could you do with that other 2000 if you did it into a Roth that you pay taxes on? And what I'm arguing is everyone's like, oh, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you retire. And, you know, you're going to be like sitting on your porch drinking lemonade. Like for me, no, I, I love what I do. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm going to be doing something. So most people are still working. Their tax bracket is still in that 30% range, number two. And number three, our country, we don't really have that much money. So I have a feeling that in order to fund Social Security, Medicare, and Andrew and Thomas's cat sweater collection in retirement, we're going to have to raise tax brackets. Mm. Tax rates mm. are going to have to go up. So if we have a, a ton of money in a pre-tax 401k, what about tax diversification? Mm. What about having a Roth and a pre-tax? Because we don't know where tax rates are going to be. And you don't know what your tax rate is going to be. Okay. Especially you real estate investor because you're going to be you're going to be hitting some big, big, you know, tax bills with all that money coming in. And Thomas will probably own YouTube by then. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to buy wait, it next week. I, I want to unpack that real quick. And, yeah, and I, it was a I, lot. I have some questions. I, I actually think that you've distilled it down way more eloquently than we have in like years. So... Um, you're saying for, you know, you get like pre-tax with 401k traditional, but when you withdraw, you need to consider the tax implications with Roth. You put it in, 
it just like a brokerage account. It's after tax and it grows tax free forever. And when you need 20 K you take 20 K and that's your 20 K and you're saying because of this whole social security thing and, and the, the deficit and blah, blah, blah. We've been talking about four years that chances are if we, if taxes go up, uh, it, it, it essentially would blow up the argument of a 401k or, or a pre-tax account. So yes. my question to you is, um, with that information, let's say that I have a company that is very moderately generous and they will match 25 cents on the dollar to every 401k contribution I put in. So if I put in a dollar, I get 25 cents and my return is 25%. Does that employer matching offset this whole Roth pre-tax, post-tax thing or how does that factor in? Well, a lot of 401ks now, Andrew, offer a Roth option. Get so out you of could town. do your matching yes. into a Roth? Yes. they sh- or, or, no, you know what? The matching may have to go to the pre-tax part because you don't have control okay. over that. Yeah, but and it's coming the from match. the company. Because right. if they yeah, were matching into a Roth, they would basically just be paying you 1.25% or 125% of your standard salary up to the Roth limit. Would, so it's almost yeah. like a raise pretty much at that point. And if they're taking the deduction, someone's got to be paying the taxes. If they're not going to pay the taxes on the match, then the government's going to make you pay the taxes on that. Mm -hmm. So you you could still get the match. And I have a feeling that their match or profit sharing would go into the pre-tax part. But that should not, and everyone needs to call up their own 401k company, preclude you from checking off the Roth option. Oh, shit. Mm. So – I, I wish we had this conversation many years earlier. Um, that's a big if. I have quite I have quite a lot that could have gone a different way. But you're saying even if like you don't log into their online portal and there's like a checkbox or whatever, chances are you can call your 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 retirement brokerage company, Fidelity, AXA, yeah. whatever, and and they can switch it for you. Well, I think there's a big if here though. I mean, so, you have to call them and find out, but. So we're saying yeah. it's likely that it, even if your 401k plan offers a, a Roth option, the matching is going to go into a pre-tax mm. account, correct? Most likely, so, yes. Okay. So if somebody has that option, they need to know what their options are for the actual funds that their 401k offers. Because mm-hmm. we say that it is always a good idea to contribute up to the matching limit because that is a return you're not going to get anywhere else. But at, after that point, then you need to figure – what are my options for the rest of my money? Because with a lot of 401ks, you're limited to uh, to funds that have big fees. So it's not actually worth it to keep contributing more money past that matching limit to your 401k when you could be taking it out and putting it into a better account that you choose because you've got the whole world of index funds, ETFs, anything open to you at that point. And there's no benefit to artificially limiting yourself other than maybe the emotional like hassle being taken off your plate of them putting it in before you even get your paycheck. But, yeah. but I don't think that's worth yeah. it. If like it's, Oh, you have the option of a, you know, 2% fee account versus yeah. the 0.05. Yeah. 0.05%. It's, it's point. It's like one fifth of 1% interest that I pay. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like what? 40 times less in fees I'm paying on the Vanguard one. So yeah, just you bring understand up an, what your options are there. You bring up a very, very important point. And I don't know if you guys covered this around um, fees on 401ks. And there's, it's a very timely thing that we, we should talk about and your listeners need to know about. Number one, um, there is a lot of pressure on employers. So this would be like IBM, right? Walmart, Costco to choose 401k providers that have low fees. That's number mm-hmm. one. And then on like June 9th or something like that, the government, basically the Department of Labor voted that anyone who is in in the arena of advising a 401k or a 401k company, a financial advisor, a trustee of a 401k, all of these people have to be fiduciaries. Oh, really? 
Yeah, so it's okay. it's the fiduciary rule. So mean so when you're talking about these higher fees, the fee compression on 401ks is going to um, get smaller, and there's a lot more regulation on what these guys can do. There's much less in kickbacks and fees. The fees will come down major off of this ruling. It's the Department of Labor ruling, and like a lot of financial okay. advisors, who um, who charge high fees on retirement accounts, mm. this is like the deer in the headlights. Like this is like they're like freaking out. It's I'm like you. It's like a I, I could cut a. a, a it's so thick. It's like crazy. So they can no they longer wanna... steal from you. They have to be reasonable. It's, it's everything's got to be on the up and up, and mm. everything is changing. And these brokerage firms are freaking out because they're now held to this fiduciary status on four hundred one ks, and um, it's costing them a lot of money to do this compliance wise. But it's really good for like the public little guy. Yeah. So without getting into the politics of it, of which I'm sure there's an enormous amount. The, who are the so the winners you're saying are the people who have retirement accounts and the losers are the people who are taking the money from those retirement accounts correct there, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with a financial advisor charging a fee for it or a mutual fund company but people don't work the for fees, free they need yeah, yeah yeah the fees are getting compressed they're not going to be egregious and uh, they're going lower and the regulation around them will – if this rule stays, it may not stay, but if – you know, because we have new a new president and all that stuff. But mm. the trend, guys, is for more transparency, more disclosure, and lower fees. That's not going away. So uh, when people talk about rolling over a 401k because you're going to save in fees or administration fees or blah, blah, blah um, – does that still hold water or is that something that also will go away? So you had a 401k from old employer, keep it forever because you're not getting screwed. Yeah, no, I mean, most of the time people will want to consolidate into an IRA rollover or a Roth IRA rollover if it was in a Roth. Um, Why? I do agree with, because what, what Thomas is saying, where you have way more choice, way more flexibility. I mean, you can buy anything in an IRA. So, so it's when a choice a, decision, not a fee decision. Uh, well, it could both. be both. Mm. It could it's be a, both. It's a choice decision to have more options for paying less fees. Okay, but it's not like you're being penalized by say, say I had a four hundred one k with Fidelity. I leave the employer that was sponsoring that. Fidelity doesn't start like charging me a fee because I'm no longer no. attached. To that okay. No, so, no, no, they don't. But a lot of times, people just have kind of a bad taste in their mouth from the employer that they were with, or they just want to start from fresh and they don't want anything associated with that. So they roll it over to an IRA and there's plenty of choice in what they could buy and, you know, low fees, index funds, Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, wherever it is. I mean, all of that stuff. So, so I want to like, I want to blast for it because I have like so many freaking questions. But if <laughs> I have this 401k and I'm rolling it over, I could roll it over into a traditional IRA, mm -hmm. which is pre-tax, just like a 401k, can I roll it over into a Roth IRA, which is post-tax, and if I can, should I be choosing that option, you know, nine times out of ten, based on our previous chat? It depends on how old you are and what your view is if whether you agree with me or not on tax rates and your own tax scenario. So let's mm -hmm. go through a hypothetical example. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use a big number now because it's easy math. Let's say you have a hundred grand in a 401k that you want to roll over to an IRA. So now you roll it over. It's now in an IRA. Now, if you move that hundred thousand from a regular IRA to a Roth, that's a taxable event. Ah. It's called a Roth conversion. That taxable event is taxable. So you have to pay federal and state, maybe city taxes on it. So let's say 40%. Mm -hmm. So you, Whoa. let's say, four, yeah, 40 G's. Wow. So you have to have 40 G's in a separate account. It You don't want to take it from your IRA because then that defeats the purpose of why you're doing it to begin with. So you have to have 40 grand on the side. You pay that 40 grand, right, right. on the side. Now you have 100 in a Roth. Now if that Roth grows to a half a million bucks, there are no taxes on that. Mm. But again, mm. the people are saying, oh, well, you could have taken this 40000 from your savings account and invested it. And had you done that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And again, I, I, I get to this weird 17-year break-even point. 
But if someone's like 65, they're not going to want to convert an IRA to a Roth because mm -hmm. they don't yeah. get the advantage of the time unless they're trying to do it to like reduce their estate tax. But most of the time, people are not going to want to do that. So the younger people would probably want to do that. And it's not all or nothing with that what 100 is younger? grand. What is younger? Like 20s, like 20 in the 20s, am, am maybe I 30s. I'm like 32. I don't know. You just had your bar mitzvah, right? Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> I'm a late the point convert. is, <laughs> the point is, is um, uh, you you don't have to take all hundred and convert it to a Roth. You could take five thousand dollars of the IRA and convert it to a Roth, and then pay taxes only on the five grand. It's like any amount you want. Just take you know thirty forty percent of any number, and that's what the and taxes. to be clear, the, the conversion of a traditional to a Roth cost-wise is the same as 401k to a Roth. Correct. Okay. Okay, so it, it, yeah. the acronyms and stuff aren't as important as pre-tax, post-tax. Correct. If you're just taking pre-tax stuff and converting it to after-tax Roth, you're going to have to pay ta taxes. If you're contributing to a Roth, you're contributing after-tax money. So you, it's it's really like pay now or pay later. So yeah. um, you know, I, I've I've led you along this path. You know, we've a, I've asked you all these questions, and now I'm gonna leave what I, I think is maybe the hardest one for the end. So we have uh, our pre-tax savings. We maybe maybe they're like in a brokerage. You know, we're we're going across four or five lane five lanes because we're um, diversified. We're rebalancing. We have our retirement accounts. When I first got my job and I was making money, I had to invest every motherfucking dollar because it was like some mental disease that I had. I had to have everything invested. But it uh, turns out that's not the best decision because if something happens and you need cash, what is an appropriate balance between what you're making, what you're investing, and what you're holding essentially in an emergency fund because i think it's first yeah yeah i think it depends on the job that you have so if you're in a job that's highly volatile or you feel like you don't have stability and security where you work let's say i'm a contract janitor in scenario a and let's say i am the president of the united states in scenario b yeah contract you know contract janitor you're going to want to have maybe six months in the bank of mm -hmm. your expenses you know, secure a job, maybe three months. We, didn't we talk about this in a recent episode, Andrew? Where we're like, we've always spouted these six months, three months numbers, and it's like, that's really difficult for people to get up to. And I guess like... Justin, what, what, what your, would you say to that? Like, so, so you're the contract janitor. You are very young. You're not earning a lot, but you aspire to much more. How do you get yeah. to even six months? And should you not be investing... Until you like get I've to got six a lot months. of friends. It, it would take them years to save up to six months expenses, like because their discretionary income, you know, maybe they've got like a two hundred dollar per month extra spending thing, so they could put two hundred dollars per month into a bank account, spend like two years doing that, and now they've got six months expenses. So, and I, we've always said it in the context of like get that before you start like accelerating debt or investing in earnest. But I it's can't hard. remember who you're talking to about it, but it was it was a recent guest yeah. who kind of pointed that out. They were like, yeah, you guys make enough discretionary income that you could probably pack away six months of uh, emergency expenses the relatively thing is, quickly. But I think that you can't get ahead or appropriately retire without investing. You know, the, the linear gains of just like socking away 200, whatever, just will not cut it with inflation and whatever. But especially when you're young, you need to get started sooner. So how do yeah. you draw the line or, or how might you structure it, Justin, so that you can get to six months, you know, and kind of have yeah. all the things? Yeah. Well, it's a very, very good question. There's a lot of things that are going on in my head about, you know, how do I want to answer this and how do I not want to be a dick about answering this? <laughs> well, I'm a dick, real. so feel comfortable. No, no, is <laughs> First off, I, I think the 401k match thing is something that people should do on average, you know, mm -hmm. based on their situation. But we've spent a lot of time today talking about what to do with the money that you're investing. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's a big, 
I mean, it's part of the reason why I started a second business teaching business owners and entrepreneurs about money is that there's not enough talk about what I call human capital, which is the ability to invest in what you're good at mm. and iterate off of that. So if you're an employee and you're a software engineer, but really your strength is in coding. Now I completely made that up. Like I don't even know if engineers code, but whatever. But if you're doing something where you're not at your best, then you need to go to your boss and be like, dude, hook me up with a coding gig and pay me a bonus on that. Or you need to make a lateral move and leave company A and go to company B and get into coding and make more off of what your strengths are. So many people in life, this is what I did for a while, just settle at what they're okay at and they know that they're not pushing themselves to get out of this level of mediocrity. And what I think people yeah. need to do is make more money, mm. is make more money, just not cut back on not get Netflix. Like get the latte, get Netflix. If you have to cancel those to get ahead, I get that. But we need to think about, well, what can we do on the making money end even if we view ourselves as an employee, there are things that you can do. I mean, you guys are living, breathing examples of this. I mean, I know, Andrew, I know that this is something that, you know, that you worked on. But people can get ahead if they just think about it in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. That's why Andrew takes every opportunity he can get to tell people to start a business. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I will say that um, – I, I get a lot of shit for harping on the business thing. And there's certainly, I, I'm sure, a meaningful amount of people listening who just like stop talking about business. It doesn't apply to me. <laughs> and, you know, I think that um, all, like, I think the one commonality between like Justin and we just talked to Farnoosh uh, like an hour ago and like all these guests is that everyone had a job. And then they also did something on the side attempting to earn money. And Justin, I know that you built your business that you're working on while you were working for another job, essentially. You pulled yeah. the, the the parachute cord. You flipped out because it's crazy, you know, but it stabilizes. But you would have been even more crazy if you jumped and had nothing. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not asking people to leave their day job, but like, here's an analogy. Like I'm married. I got three kids, right? Mm. 14, 12 and nine. I got lots of action going on in my house. Gobs, right? I got to believe that there are a few people listening right now who are in their twenties and thirties and are not married, single, have no kids. And I'll be like, I have no time. I'm like, you think you have no time? You just you have no idea how much you you will be up to your ears in formula and and poopy diapers before you're going to have no time. Yeah. So do something yep. now that gives you a sense of fulfillment and possibility of making money from it. Well, I just want to I want to highlight something we talked about with Farnoosh here again because uh, I think repetition is useful. Farnoosh mentioned that when she was at certain jobs, she would take on extra projects, little side things at the job that weren't really in her job description. So, and this happened to me as well. I was a network tech in my internship and then they were like, hey, we need you to build this spreadsheet for a biz dev project we're working on. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And as you take on these new jobs, you gain new skills. So when you maybe leave that job and move on to another one, you're able to bring in new skills you didn't have before. And like she talked about, you could get paid a lot more. So. It's not just, oh, you got to go start a business. Oh, you got to have a side hustle or you got to buy a real estate property. You, you can also invest in your, your own skills. Even if you decide to use those skills to work for somebody else for the entirety of your life, if you're building those skills, that's an investment. You know, so. that's an awesome point. And, and I would liken it very much to this investing conversation where – uh, if you sit and do nothing, the the exponential gains of five, ten years down the road of that minimal effort, it, like you don't have the chance to compound that one hour a day you put into something. Uh, and I, I mean, honestly, the podcast you're listening to, this business, is living proof of what one hour a day can do. I quit my quit my job, four years. Amazing, and amazing. I but and I'm not looking for a pat on the back because I am. There are so many people listening that are far smarter than me that have a much better work ethic than I do. Uh, it's I think it's if anything it's persistence. Yep. You just have to be stubborn enough to keep failing. 
so that you could just fail at a bigger scale. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I, I think we've probably covered a good amount in this episode, mm. given people a lot to chew on. The one thing that I forgot to do when we started this episode is like, let people know who Justin really is and what he does. Uh, I know we did that the last time we talked with you, Justin, but I do want to give you the floor for a couple seconds here just to say, you know, what you do. If you've got online resources for people to move forward from here, definitely sure. shout them out. Yeah. So I have two businesses. One is a financial planning firm. It's a fee only financial planning firm. That's called Crane Financial Solutions. Um, so I'm a CFP. What you know, does do fee all only mean? Oh, that's a whole nother episode. Basically, okay, he doesn't take a percentage of your gains. He just charges a fee. But yeah, like I it, it's it's I don't get paid commissions from third parties or anything like that. It's just we have an agreed upon fee that the client pays me. It's my in writing. My success they, doesn't penalize me for working with you, essentially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, so that's that. And then I started a new business about three years ago, um, which is about teaching business owners how to be smart with the money that they're making in their business so they can fund their goals on the personal side. Because I just mm -hmm. found that no one was really doing I mean, there are some people that do it, but not to the extent that I wanted to. So yeah. um, that's that. And um, I don't have a name yet, but I, I've tr I've kind of I bought the domain intentional profits. I really like that because I think okay. a lot about money in life is about being intentional. Um, but they can find me there um, at J the letter J K R A N E dot com J Crane dot com. So if I go Perfect. to J Crane dot com, I could reach out to you about uh, either of the two businesses and be like, hey, Justin, like. Help me. Yeah, for sure. Jcrane.com is going to be a little bit more about the um, the business side of things, and CraneFinancialSolutions.com with a K is going to be more about investing and all of that kind of stuff. So either one, or they can find me on Facebook and all that stuff. I will Sweet. say that I've been very lucky that I've gotten some J Crane over nacho chips and whatever for free. Uh, <laughs> email this dude; he's as awesome in real person as he is on audio. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's been great to be on with you guys. I love what you're doing. I love your show. Um, keep it up. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. And thank you for coming on the show. This is an awesome episode. I know people are going to get a lot out of this. So cool. guys, if you want to connect with Justin, you want to see what he's doing in the world, we're going to have all those links we just mentioned in the show notes. So definitely go check those out. Um, we did mention real estate investing a couple times during this episode. That is something you're interested in. It's definitely not a beginner thing, but if you have leveled up past the beginning stages, Andrew built a tool over at simplewealth.co that can let you evaluate any property that you got your eye on, see how it's likely to cash flow. So it's a very good tool to use during those research stages before you buy anything. So check that out. And then we've also listed all of our favorite resources for budgeting, investing, books we recommend, all kinds of good stuff at listenmoneymatters.com slash toolbox. And hey, over on my podcast, the College Info Geek podcast, we usually ask people to go review our show on iTunes. And people have been stepping up over there, which is awesome. And I have noticed there hasn't been a review on Listen Money Matters in a couple of weeks here. What? So, what's up, guys? You let my podcast listeners show you up. So, guys, if you <laughs> like this show... And if you can deal with my blatant audience manipulation here, <laughs> go over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. It definitely helps the show out. It really bumps us up the rankings in iTunes. It helps the show get out to new listeners. It helps us grow the audience, You know, get more sponsors, and be able to do this full time and bring you the best financial education that we can possibly bring you. So thank you so much if you do that. And hey, thank you for listening as well. We sincerely appreciate the fact that you just tune into this show every week. And uh, I think that's all we got. So... Until next week, see you later. Later, man. Later. Please tell your friends about this show. <laughs>